the approach that we take from our perspective is to really focus in on the victim, meet their needs, as well as get to know them for an investigative process. Uh, the operations that you're going to see that we do here in a moment are kind of unique in that, yeah, we go out, we conduct the in-call, out-call operations, we affect the detention of the individual, bring them back, and what's different for us is we talk to each of them. So we get to know their story. What's happening? How did you get here? Who have you worked for in the past? Uh, and really develop that relationship rapport with them so that we can get a greater understanding, not just of the, the criminal enterprise that they might currently be involved with, but kind of uh, the environment as a whole, as well as them as an individual. Their, that information is then um, given to our victim specialist, who they, we then have a team of individuals who, as we talked about before from our service provider perspective, will sit down with them, we'll talk with them, we'll offer different services. So that's kind of the unique differentiation that we have as a group as far as what we do. So child victims, uh, as I talked about before, we see quite often, and that's probably one of the most difficult um, situations for us to deal with in, in really meeting the needs of those that are out there. But I really want to impart the, the understanding that these kids come from everywhere. If we go back to the last slide, in just our general area, we think it's only the inner city and it's only you know, the at-risk at kids that uh, are in the inner city or, or don't have a, a father and mother. And that's, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, we see victims from across the board, from way up in the UP, all the way down to the nice, sub nicest suburbs uh, in, in the metro areas. And so this is one of the hardest parts, is to really see the process that evolves over the period of time. Um, and this is why we work so hard. And the investigators that we have really pour their entire heart into what we do on a consistent basis, because we want to put a stop to what's really happening here. Tattooing, um, of course, you know, they're, these victims are treated as property. So you can see t the pimps are big with tattooing their property. You can see on the inside of her lip, it's got the pimp's name wrote on it. You can see this girl here has a barcode. The other one has a, another uh, tattoo of her pimp on her uh, back area. You know, we talk about, you know, who are these victims? They're like Mike hit on already. All different races. They come from all different backgrounds. Um, who, a lot of children who run away from homes are picked up um, and lured into sex trafficking. You have children with low self-esteem. Um, they're looking for someone to fill that void, and those pimps are out there preying on those girls. They did a study out of the University of Toledo uh, back in 2007, and that's where these next probably four or five slides are going to come from. But when kids run away from home, Generally, within 48 hours, they're lured into prostitution. If you think about it, there's only a couple ways a minor can survive on the streets. They're either selling themselves or they're selling drugs. There are over 500,000 children in foster care in the United States. And I hate to say it, we've arrested foster care parents for taking in troubled youth and then turning around and exploiting them themselves. The study shown that 91% of the girls experience or 90% of the girls experience some kind of abuse at home, either neglect, physical, or sexual. Out of that 91%, 57 were raped by someone outside their family, 30% by someone within their family, and 14% of the girls were raped by someone inside and outside their family. And that's sort of what made them easy targets for these exploiters and for these pimps. How is recruitment done? So obviously there's a huge change in paradigm shift over the last several years with how to these exploiters are going out and, and getting the girls. Uh, predominantly right now it's the social media, it's the apps that are on the telephones, it's, uh, it's the kick messenger, uh, which is the devil. If any of your kids have that, get rid of it. Um, so those are the different types of platforms that are out there. That's the initiation. Uh, also things that they, that they do is the escort website. Ed talked about before where they'll sit there and the pimps will just go down the, the line and, and contact all the girls, try to set up dates with them so that they can take them over. Um, and so oftentimes what we see as well is friends and or family, specifically with, with kids, that's what happens, is girls will bring their friends or they'll bring their sister and they'll start to get involved. They'll start to see the nice things that they have, the attention that people are giving them, and so they'll get involved as well. Uh, how, how many parents in here with younger kids are just getting their cell phones or about to get their cell phones? Quite a few. What you might want to consider, I don't think we have too many kids, so I'll 
tell this. MyMobileWatchdog.com, if you go to that site, you can put an app on your child's phone and you can see who they're communicating with. You can see if they're sending pictures, if they're receiving pictures. You can see their text messages coming and going. And you can put it on their phone. Unless they're real tech savvy, they won't be able to find it. My mobile watchdog. Our social networks, here we have, obviously, Facebook is a huge platform. Um, Instagram, um, Twitter, those are all networks that are used right now. Right now, I just got uh, word in the last week of a network of um, individuals, uh, kids, that are prostituting and or providing sex acts before school, and they're doing it via Instagram. So they've put it out there. Uh, and it actually looks like it is a senior female um, that is the one that's running this group of individuals that's doing it. So uh, kids pimping kids, if you will. So this is all being done via the social network analysis, or social networks, if you will. Here we have uh, one of our prominent pimps that uh, we're going to go into real brief, briefly later on. But this is what his black planet is. He just puts it right out there. It's like, hey, looking for girls that want to... Uh, Come work for me. I provide an escort service. You'll get to travel. I'll pay all the expenses. Uh, anyone interested, get at me. As we said earlier, the average age of recruitment is estimated between 14 and 16. More of the, uh, I've heard more of around 16. Um, and the life expectancy after entering into a life of prostitution is approximately seven years. Uh, what we've seen is a significant increase and in uptick in the use of hard drugs, heroin, crack, the combination of the two. They usually begin with opiates, Vicodin, oxys, and then they kind of progress over a period of time and things go downhill pretty quickly. Victims often subjected to severe beatings um, uh, on a consistent basis. And just think back to those pictures of those uh, two young ladies that you saw, the uh, eight pictures over the course of nine months, and it really illustrates kind of the life experiences that they're going through. You can see the drug addiction coupled with the intense and, and, and brutal beatings that they're receiving and just the, just the, every, the, the life really left their eyes. Um, and that's kind of what's being experienced on a day-to-day -day basis. Domestic human trafficking, um, like I said previously, the majority of what we encounter specific to our region is uh, going to be an online presence, which will then be um, housed in either a house a, 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 and probably more prevalent, a hotel. Um, oftentimes, they will also come to you. So that's the majority of what we have. But we also, within our region, have truck stops uh, where individuals will walk the, the, the truck stops strip clubs, the streets, um, after hours, and parties, and conventions, and so on and so forth. But predominantly, we have an online presence with a couple at the hotels. Who are likely to encounter these victims? Uh, everyone, no matter where you work, where you travel. You could be going into a Dunkin' Donuts, thinking you're getting your coffee, I mean, there could be a victim in there. Some of the uh, issues in terms of that makes it hard to identify these victims, uh, easy to obtain, fake IDs, that's huge. Um, they're trained to lie to law enforcement, to not trust law enforcement. One of the things we're seeing throughout the nation now is that these exploiters and pimps, if they have a minor, they're putting them in a position to get arrested for, say, shoplifting or something small, telling them to say, this is your name, this is your date of birth, that makes them an adult. So when they're processed, if that department doesn't dig deeper, that officer dig deeper, now that child has been entered into the system as an adult. So when they get picked up in a sex trafficking sting or a prostitution sting, and their fingerprints are ran, that child comes back as an adult, and they continue to go through the system as a juvenile. The physical consequences of human trafficking, um, I think these are... They're, they're too numerous to really even highlight, but just to, just to some to really speak to here, is uh, the excessive bruising, the beatings, um, the sexually transmitted diseases that are there, the psychological effects, the, just the lasting impressions that are there, um, and, and sometimes death. The psychological impact, and I think this is where, again, uh, we work 
hand in, in glove with a lot of our, our service providers is to really meet the traumatic needs of, of the victims that we encounter. And as you can see, is this, the, list, the list that's here, uh, it's, it's pretty pronounced in some of the things that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, most of the, the young ladies, and I say ladies because those are most predominantly who we encounter from a sex trafficking perspective. Um, I would say proportionately, we're at probably 98%. Are you waving to me? No, I was. No, you know, somebody okay. Up here waving. <laughs> <laughs> I was waving. To me. waving. <laughs> uh, predominantly is uh, is females. So when I say that, that's why. So we we work very closely with the individuals with with the Stockholm syndrome, with the different uh, needs that might be there, so that they can get their needs met and be reintroduced to uh, society and be uh, a functioning, if you will. Some of the uh, immediate needs of the victims, uh, it's listed up there. Some of the biggest thing is housing, 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 and treatment, you know, where do they go? Even picking up some of the minors, we have a protocol here in Michigan now where we're mandated reporters as law enforcement, so you have to call CP CPS and let them know you have a juvenile that's involved in a sex trafficking operation and they will do an investigation um, on that. Um, we're lucky, at least on our side of the state, where we have Vista Maria and a couple other programs where that child can go and they have a human trafficking program there that's for minors um, where they're actually housed there and it's a secure facility. Um, that sort of helps us with the legal guardianship uh, issue because sometimes it's not best for that child to go back home. And I hate to say it, sometimes that pimp was treating that child better than their own parents. We also, from last year, that came out a, a new law where we can actually petition that child be placed in a secure facility without charging them for prostitution or charging them with a crime um, so they can get the help. So that's great. It's uh, been used about six times um, right now, so I'm hoping that once the word gets out and we get more people trained, um, that this will be used more, I think, for Operation Cross Country. We used it maybe about five times ourselves, um, which was great. And these girls are actually getting the treatment that they need, getting help, and that arrest or them getting picked up and the prostitution thing isn't going on their record. Pimps and the buyers. We'll uh, go over this uh, real quick. They're everyone. Um, generally, males, 99.9999% are males buying sex. Um, all different races. Um, a lot of them, most of them are professionals. Um, we've had, you know, attorneys, judges, officers, businessmen, executives that we've picked up in some of our stings. Some of the challenges we see, of course, law enforcement working with social services. You guys think that's an issue? Does law enforcement work well with social services? No. no? Well, we're going to have to work better together to tackle this problem. Um, we're, at least on our side of the state, we've made that shift where we are working a lot better um, with social services. We've actually had them come out and do ride-alongs with us so they can see from our side when we're doing the things and all that. And I think that helps sort of mend that bridge or mend us together better. I think also the lack of public knowledge, um, which is getting a lot better here in Michigan, um, so we're not having those challenges as much. In terms of, uh, the question is in terms of if you're in a neighborhood and signs you can look out for, it could be traffic to the house. Um, you know, if they're running a house of prostitution, you're going to see a lot of cars, a lot of men coming all sorts of uh, times, uh, day and night. Um, labor, it could be like that video you saw. If you see, you know, 50 people, 100 people in a house and it's not like a graduation party, you could... Uh, <laughs> have an issue there as well. Um, how is the house? Is it uh, fortified? You know, are the bars on the inside of the house and not the outside of the house? Um, that could be something that could be an indicator um, for you as well. If you see a lot of trash being thrown out, but it only looks like one person lives there, should they really have that much trash they're throwing out? Maybe it's more people that are stashed at that house. Um, and just listening, I mean, you could hear if you hear fights, yelling, it could be a lot of different things. I would say, if you're in doubt, report it, let law enforcement figure it out. Did you have anything to add to that? No, we're good. Thank you guys for, for listening to us today. I know it can be a <laughs> daunting. So thank you very much.